Do you ever feel like there are so many health and wellness products out there that you're left feeling totally overwhelmed? You wish you could just skip the trial and error and just know exactly what will work for you. Well, I've partnered with an amazing new service that can help you do just that. It's called Wild Health, and it's a precision medicine service. They combine an in-depth genetic analysis with extensive blood work and a lifestyle assessment to provide you with a fully comprehensive picture of your health. It's like you've never seen it before. You'll receive a 50-plus page personalized health report covering everything from your optimal diet, exercise, supplement routine, to your risk of chronic disease and prevention strategies. You also get paired with a dedicated doctor and health coach who will help you understand and apply the biggest opportunities for maximizing your health. Your team might recommend a mindfulness plan or hot cold therapy instead of going straight to prescriptions. It's truly a different approach to health, driven not only by your data, but your lifestyle. Your biology is unique, and it's time that your healthcare caught up with it. Get started with Wild Health and enjoy 20% off with code DRFIT20 at wildhealth.com. That's D-R-F-I-T-2-0 at wildhealth.com for 20% off. to the Fit and Fabulous podcast with Dr. Jamie Seaman. Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Jamie, and welcome back to the Fit and Fabulous podcast. It's so wonderful to have you here today. Well, I want to introduce today's guest, Dr. Philip Ovedia. Dr. Ovedia has conducted over 3,000 heart surgeries, and that has taught him that good health comes from lifestyle and nutrition, not from surgery. He's now on a mission to help people stay off his operating table by giving them the tools and the mindset to never need a heart surgeon. Dr. Ovedia currently lives and practices down in Florida with his wonderful wife and two amazing daughters. And I can't wait for you to tell us how to stay off your operating table because I sure as heck don't want to find myself there. (laughs) Although I will come visit you in Florida because it's rather cold in Nebraska. Dr. Ovedia, welcome to the Fit and Fabulous podcast. Thanks, Jamie. It is great to be here with you. Well, so nobody writes a book like this or tries to put themselves out of a job without probably some compelling story. So tell us a little bit about your background and how you ever got to this place. Yeah, sure thing. And, you know, my personal and my professional journey uh, really have combined to lead me where I am today. Uh, You know, from the professional side of things, I found myself uh, 10 plus years into my career as a heart surgeon, uh, and I was very unhealthy. I was morbidly obese. I was pre-diabetic. And I realized that I was going to end up on my own operating table, so to speak. I was following the same path that so many of my patients had followed. Um, I knew my family history, which is that my grandmother underwent multiple heart surgeries and ultimately died of heart disease. Uh, My dad had heart disease and had heart surgery. So I knew I was heading down a pretty bad path, but I didn't know what to do about it because I had followed all the advice that I had learned in school, all the advice that I would give my patients, and it wasn't working for me. Um, I struggled with obesity for most of my life since childhood. Um, I was raised in a household that very much followed the the food guidelines. Uh, My older brother is a type one diabetic. We didn't have sugar in the house. We ate all the low fat products. We had the skim milk. We had the margarine. Um, You know, we were putting that skim milk on our heart healthy Cheerios. And yet I became more and more obese. Um, as a child. The other thing, you know, that I always note is I was very active. I played sports year round, you know, rode my bike, uh, outside walking, you know, this is of course, I I grew up in the, uh, you know, late 1970s, early 1980s. So we didn't have, uh, you know, the devices to keep us indoors out day, all day. And so by all rights, you know, I should have been a healthy person. And yet I wasn't. And, you know, as I went through medical school, there were a couple of times where I said, I got to change this. You know, I don't want to be an unhealthy doctor. And I, I did the things. I counted my calories. I ate a low fat diet. I moved more. I got, went to the gym. And like so many people, I lose some weight. I have some success. And then I end up gaining it back and more. 
Thankfully, you know, things started to change for me about seven years ago. A uh, number of events happened, but probably the most important one was I was actually at a surgical meeting, the Society of Thoracic Surgeons. And for some reason that I still haven't figured out, Gary Taubes was the invited lecturer at that meeting. And he had just written the case against sugar. And, you know, when Gary started talking about the concept that the types of food that we eat are more important than the amount of food that we eat. Uh, it just made sense. And I read Gary's books. I started looking into it more and I, you know, did it. I cut out sugar. I went low carb. I had great success. I lost over a hundred pounds ultimately. And more importantly, I've been able to keep that off for the first time in my life. This is now seven years into it. And it led me to start to question, why didn't I learn about this in school? Why did I hear about this from a journalist? You know, by no means any disrespect to Gary, but why was I hearing about this from a journalist and not from, you know, my professors and my colleagues? Um, and, you know, I started looking into it more and more, started researching more and more, realized that, you know, this is the root cause of heart disease. And that was a big, you know, kind of realization to come to that, you know, I had spent my entire career focusing on one disease and we were treating it wrong. Right. And uh, that has now led me to the path where, you know, I understand that most of what I do as a heart surgeon is preventable and people should not need me as a heart surgeon and they should be able to stay off my operating table. And that is, you know, as a physician, I am compelled to get that information to as many people as possible. Wow. That's powerful because as surgeons, people think we just want to operate, right? So um, what made you want to be a cardiothoracic surgeon? Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. I went to medical school knowing I wanted to be a surgeon and I don't really know why that was. I just, I just knew. And as I went through medical school and as I went through, you know, rotations, uh, it was surgery that I love. And so, uh, I did a, uh, you know, I started a general surgery, uh, internship and residency and, uh, wasn't, you know, quite sure which surgical specialty I was going to end up in. Uh, but once I did cardiac surgery, I was, I was hooked. The combination of the technical skills that are involved in that and the physiology, you know, uh, people, you know, surgeons sometimes have a reputation, like you said, that, you know, we're just there to cut. Uh, and so, uh, but, you know, the, the physiology that goes into heart surgery is really amazing. Um, the history of heart surgery, how it got developed is amazing. So uh, I, was, I was immediately drawn to it. And uh, after completing my general surgery training, I did my cardiac surgical fellowship. And uh, I love what I do as a heart surgeon. Um, I just today want to be doing less of it uh, because uh, I, I now realize that, you know, it, no matter how good I am as a heart surgeon, no matter how good all the heart surgeons are out there, you're never as good after the heart surgery as if you never needed surgery in the first place. Yeah. Can you give us an idea for people listening? What kind of uh, what kind of procedures or what kind of problems do you treat on a day to day basis that are caused by poor lifestyle? Yeah. So the most common operation that I do, the most common heart surgery that's done in the United States and worldwide, is what's called coronary artery bypass grafting. So this is a way to deal with blockages in the arteries of the heart, atherosclerotic heart disease. Um, that is the number one killer of people in the U.S. and worldwide. And coronary artery bypass grafting is one of the most common operations done in the United States today. And, you know, basically we're rerouting the blood around the blockages. We're, we're changing out the plumbing, essentially, is what we're doing to try and deal with that problem. And the, the you know, the problem with that approach to dealing with blockages in the arteries is it does nothing for what caused those, those blockages to occur in the first place. And if you don't address what caused that patient to end up on the table in the first place, they're going to be back. And we know that people who undergo bypass surgery are very likely to need more things done 
in the future. They're going to need stents. They might need another surgery. And ultimately, most of them still die of heart disease. So we improve their symptoms in the short term. We extend their life. They die later of heart disease, but they still end up dying from the process because we haven't done anything to address the root cause. And the yeah. root cause is what we eat first and foremost. Yeah. So let's talk about that. Like when you're going through your training, what were you taught that caused this problem? Atherosclerosis. Yeah. So we were taught it was cholesterol. You know, I, uh, did my, my, uh, I finished medical school in 1998. I finished my surgical training in 2005. And, you know, at that time, um, it was all about cholesterol. Cholesterol was viewed as the singular cause of heart disease. And of course, you know, statins by that time had become the most common prescribed class of medication worldwide. And everyone was focused on lowering cholesterol. All the guidelines had come out about lowering cholesterol, all the dietary recommendations, low fat diets, you know, this was, that was their um, heyday. And yet here we are now 20 years later, and there has been zero impact on the incidence of heart disease. Heart disease is still far and away the number one killer in the United States, despite the fact that statins are the most prescribed class of medication in the United States. And so admittedly, you know, I didn't question this at all for most of my career, but when you just look at those two macro facts, you have to step back and say, something's got to be wrong here, because if we're treating, you know, all of these people with medications that's supposed to address the root cause of the problem, yet they're still getting the problem, you know, that doesn't make sense ultimately. And of course, now I know that cholesterol is not the primary driver of heart disease. Uh, and we'll, you know, we'll probably touch on what actually is. Uh, but, you know, I, I do look back and uh, I am humbled uh, that I was so blinded to what was occurring in front of me uh, and that yeah. the medical system continues to be so oblivious to what is, should be obvious. Yeah, yeah. So statins, of course, have become very controversial. You know, there's certainly cardiologists that have spoken out about it. Um, and, you know, certainly I think a pushback from, you know, some people in society just against medicine, I feel like COVID kind of almost exacerbated that a little bit more like, oh, you're just trying to give us these medicines. Are there people though, that benefit from statins? Who would that be? They don't have yeah, help so the vast majority of people, or, I mean, I guess kind of give us your, you know, opinion. Yeah. So, you know, when you look at the data around statins, uh, there is some benefit to a small amount of people. Um, so, you know, the situation where they have been shown to have the most benefit, and again, it's still a small benefit, but it, it is the most benefit, is what we call secondary prevention. People who have already had heart attacks, uh, you know, all, have already had a stent placed, already had surgery in preventing a, a secondary event. Um, and, you know, there is, I would say, some usefulness in that situation. But even in that situation, when you look at it, um, you know, the, the, the number needed to treat that comes out of that situation is still 30 to 40. So, you know, for every 30 to 40 people that we're treating with statins in that situation, one of them is getting benefit. Um, when you look at what's called primary prevention, you know, trying to prevent the first heart attack, those numbers needed to treat are somewhere between, you know, 100 to 300. Uh, so only one out of every, you know, 300 people is going to get benefit. Um, when I look at that, what that tells me is we need to do a better job of figuring out, you know, who are those people that benefit. And I think really a lot of the problems with the way that statins are used is we're, we're, deciding who to use them on based on a very lousy metric, LDL cholesterol. It's a horrible measure of risk, but by no matter what way you look at it. And yet that is the singular data point that we use essentially to decide who gets these medications. And we're treating a bunch of people who, you know, clearly aren't going to benefit from it. So first and foremost, what I tell people around the statin issue and around the cholesterol issue is, your physician needs to do a better job of figuring out, you know, are you actually at risk and are you going to benefit from taking this medication? 
Yeah. So I am a gynecologist and I get patients who come into my clinic with their cholesterol panel. And they're like, Dr. Seaman, I want your opinion on this because I've been on this ketogenic diet and my LDL is high and my doctor would like me to start a statin. And I just don't feel comfortable with that. And I'd like your opinion. Well, first of all, I'm a gynecologist. Okay. I didn't train in cardiology. I don't, <laughs> and, uh, but I'll tell you what I do. Cause I'm very open-minded is, you know, we look at their family history. We look at what their other risk factors are. We look at their other labs. What's their fasting glucose? What's their fasting insulin? And we look at the other parts of this lipid panel besides the LDL. So I look at their triglycerides, their triglyceride to HDL ratio. And there, but there are some people who come to me with really high LDL levels. And I'm wondering your opinion in that situation. Um, I've been using coronary artery calcium scans a lot in this situation for risk stratification, um, or to see if there's, you know, existing disease. Is that a, is that a, a good idea? What for somebody listening that has, you know, they're trying to do the right things, but they have isolated really high LDL. Is there a test or something they should do to figure out what their risk is? Yeah. So I think the coronary artery calcium scan is a great test to use and specifically in that situation. And again, that is actually following the guidelines. You know, most doctors, they talk about so much about following the guidelines and they don't realize what's in the guidelines. And the guidelines say, if your only risk factor for heart disease is, a, is an isolated, elevated LDL cholesterol, uh, then a CAC scan should be considered. You know, the guidelines kind of, uh, uh, you know, couch it a little bit. But um, a CAC scan is a great test in that situation because the data is pretty clear. If your coronary artery calcium score is zero, there's no benefit to taking statins. Now, you always have to take into account the patient's age. The younger you are, the less you know, weight you can put to a zero score, uh, mm -hmm. but it's still another data point. The other thing that I commonly do in that situation is get the advanced lipid testing, you know, looking at their particle sizes um, to determine, you know, do we have the type of LDL cholesterol that is, you know, more likely to be involved in plaque formation, which is the small dense LDL cholesterol, which is the oxidized LDL cholesterol, or do we have a whole lot of the type of LDL cholesterol that is not involved in plaque formation, large fluffy LDL particles. And if you have a whole lot of large fluffy LDL particles floating around, I don't think that's giving you any risk of heart disease. And so there's no reason to try and lower it whether you want to, you know, talk about diet or medications, there's no reason to lower it if it's not causing you problems. Yeah. So I'm using these advanced cardiac panels too, um, because I think they're really helpful because they give a lot of markers like high sensitivity CRP, which is a marker of inflammation. They also give these other apolipoproteins. So like APOA, APOB and LP little a, can you tell people, so you've kind of described this, this particle size issue. Can you tell people what these other markers are and how they may play into your risk? Yeah, so APOA and APOB are a way, another way to count uh, the number of cholesterol particles, essentially. So, you know, on the uh, standard cholesterol panel, when you get your LDL and your HDL, that's your total amount of cholesterol, basically, in your bloodstream is a way that I explain it to people. Uh, when you get APOA and APOB, uh, you're counting, you know, kind of the number of cholesterol particles. And, uh, you know, you can kind of figure that if you have a whole lot of cholesterol and it's in a low number of particles, that those are all going to be large particles, essentially. And so, you know, large particles we know are not as concerning when it comes to LDL cholesterol. So APOA, APOB, um, are, I think, better measures of risk, but they still suffer from the same problem in that they're really not telling us, are these damaged uh, cholesterol particles or these small cholesterol particles that are going to form plaque, or are these you know, normal, large cholesterol particles that are not going to cause risk? Uh, so that's where the, you know, the size uh, comes into play. LP little a is um, a is related to cholesterol. It's actually a, a, a type of LDL cholesterol particle, but it really is a whole different uh, animal uh, because LP little a 
has this little attachment on it that makes it interact with the uh, blood clotting system, the fibrolytic system. And when you have high levels of LP little a, um, you are at greater risk of forming blood clots, which is one of the major contributors to heart disease and heart attacks. Um, again, that we don't really think about. Um, it's thought that LP little a is mostly genetically determined. Um, I do see influence of diet on LP little a. I do see people that are able to lower their LP little a levels with dietary changes. Uh, so I, I don't think it's completely genetically determined, but I think we sort of all have a range and it can be another marker, you know, of risk essentially. So when you're trying to figure out something, uh, you know, when you're trying to figure out someone's heart disease risk, the reality is, is it's not a simple thing to figure out. And there are all of these factors that go into it. And again, I think one of the biggest mistakes we have made in medicine is that we thought that we could reduce it to one factor. We thought that we could base all of this decision-making on one number. And I think that is just, you know, completely erroneous way to think. Yeah, it's really like myopic. Um, yep. So back to the one thing you said about young people in CACs and it not being as helpful, right? Because it doesn't give as much time for these plaques to be calcified. I've seen there's some newer tests and I don't even think we offer it in our area, to be honest, these clearly scans that are looking at soft plaques. Do you think this is yep. going to be helpful at identifying people with early disease? Yeah, it may be. Um, and, you know, so what the clearly scan is, is it's just a basically a different way to analyze a CT angiogram. So the difference between a CAC scan, coronary artery calcium scan, and a CT angiogram is that for the CT angiogram, they're actually going to give dye. They're going to put an IV and they're going to give you dye. Um, we slow the heart rate down when we do the test. And then we can actually see that dye moving through the arteries so we can get a sense of whether there's narrowing in that artery or not. Um, so they're kind of complementary tests. The coronary artery calcium scan is only going to show you if there's calcium in your artery. The CT angiogram shows you if there's narrowing in the artery. And then what the clearly test does is it sort of layers on top of that and it analyzes you know, the pictures uh, in a way that now you can see how much hard plaque there is, how much soft plaque there is, and how much narrowing there is. I think it is a very useful test, um, you know, but it needs to be used more carefully. Um, you know, there are some risks associated with it. You're giving dye to people. It does involve more radiation than the CAC scan. So I, I, I don't think it's a good first test, a good screening test. Uh, but I think, you know, there are situations where it can be used. Um, you know, the, what I tell young people when they have a CAC scan is if your score is zero, you know, you really shouldn't be worried about heart disease in the next five years, as opposed to if you're 60 years old and you have a CAC score of zero, I think that's a good 10 to 20 year predictor of risk. And in younger people, it's just a shorter sort of guarantee period. And I think the answer in that situation is just, you know, you can scan more often. I think coronary artery calcium scans can be done more often than they typically are and should be done. Do you find that it is possible to reduce your CAC score, reduce calcified plaques, or once they're there, are they there? Yeah, so very controversial, but I have now worked with a number of people who have reduced their CAC scores, you know, 15, 20%. You don't go from a couple of hundred to zero, uh, but you can, can reduce it some. And, you know, there's always, uh, uh, there's always a little bit of a question of, you know, are you really comparing the same thing? Are you diff getting different cuts, different areas? You know, all of this is not an exact science. The bottom line, though, is as long as your score isn't getting worse, we know that your risk is going down. So mm -hmm. someone who has a you know, moderate or even a high score to start with, if they go a year or two years and their scan, their score does not change, they are now in a lower risk category uh, than someone else that has that same exact score. So that's yeah. another great use of the CAC scan that I think, you know, most doctors fail to utilize. A lot of cardiologists just think of this as a one-time test 
And I really use it as a metric of progress with my patients. And I get the scans on a repeated basis to see if what we're doing is working or not. Yeah. I've heard people say the rate of change is more important than, you know, like the absolute number. So I had a family member who uh, had been on a statin since statins were invented, <laughs> found out, uh, you know, later in their like sixth decade of life, they had significant coronary artery disease, despite being on a statin for like a bajillion years and um, had a really high CAC score, like 1200 or something like this. And of course I did a little, you know, nudging, a little coaching. They started working with an integrative cardiologist. And, uh, their traditional cardiologist was like, not into it, like told them that, that they were wasting their money. It's all like woo woo. It doesn't have that much of impact, told her to eat a low fat Mediterranean diet. Um, did not like the fact that she was eating a low carb ketogenic diet, despite the fact that her years of statin use turned into pre-diabetes. And, um, she ended up having a few little symptoms that precipitated a CT angio and, I believe there was a year or two between the scans, but her coronary calcium score went down like a couple hundred points, um, between the, between the scans. And so that was the first time, you know, uh, you know, close to me that I, that I, I think there maybe probably was a little bit of, you know, help there, some reversal, maybe, um, time will tell. Okay. So let's talk about what causes heart disease. If it's not cholesterol, (laughs) what is it? Yeah, I mean, it is insulin resistance and and to think otherwise, uh, you know, is just not paying attention to all the data that's out there. And, uh, you know, this isn't even uh, new science. I mean, we go back to the work of uh, Jerry Reven in the 1970s and 1980s, Joseph Kraft, um, you know, they pretty clearly showed that insulin resistance is the biggest risk factor for heart disease. And when we look at the more modern, you know, studies that have been done that directly compare the impact of insulin resistance and elevated cholesterol levels, um, it's not even close. Uh, You know, the most recent uh, study that really looked at this, the Women's Health Initiative data, um, you know, showed that the risk associated with an elevated LDL cholesterol level was like 1.4x, and the risk associated with insulin resistance was 10x. Uh, So, you know, just uh, orders of magnitude difference in uh, risk there. And, um, you know, the bottom line is that this has been consistently shown. Uh, I did a talk last year where I, I went through every study that had directly compared the two, and there was not a single study that showed that LDL cholesterol was even close to the risk prediction of insulin resistance. So, um, In my mind, it's all about insulin resistance. I think cholesterol is a secondary player. I think if you are not insulin sensitive, if you are insulin resistant, if you are metabolically unhealthy, having a high LDL cholesterol is then an additive risk on top of that. Uh, But the answer is not to go after the LDL cholesterol. The answer is to, you know, reverse your insulin resistance. Yeah. I mean, when you think about diabetics, like they don't actually die of diabetes, <laughs> they die of heart disease. Like we know that diabetes is like a major risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Um, we know that gestational diabetics are at an increased risk for cardiovascular disease over their lifetime. Preeclampsia and other hypertensive disorders of pregnancy are related to hyperinsulinemia. Those patients are at risk, right? So, um, blood sugar problems are very damaging to the arteries. And, um, so let's talk about how to prevent that. So what are we doing wrong in the American diet that's causing insulin resistance and heart disease? Well, we're pretty much doing everything wrong. It's, it's kind of scary. You know, you look at, uh, where we have gotten to, as, uh, you know, from a dietary standpoint, and, um, we almost couldn't have made it worse if we were trying to. Uh, And this really goes back to the push uh, to the, you know, the concept that low fat diets uh, were, um, you know, beneficial for heart disease. And the problem with low fat diets, first and foremost, is they necessitate processed food. Um, You can't get low fat food without doing, you know, processing of it. Uh, So that's problem number one. And, uh, you know, problem number two is, when you do that processing, when you take the fat out of whatever food you're modifying, you have to replace it with sugar and carbohydrates to 
you know, make it palatable. Uh, so this ends up being the biggest problem in the American diet. In, in, I shouldn't even call it the American diet anymore because it has spread worldwide. Uh, but processed food uh, is the primary driver of not only heart disease, but most of the chronic diseases that we face, because we know that, you know, seven out of the top 10 causes of death every year in the United States are attributable to poor metabolic health. And that poor metabolic health is the result of an overly processed uh, diet, first and foremost. So I think everybody agrees, whether you're vegan or carnivore or somewhere in between, that the removal of these ultra processed foods and really focusing on whole foods is a very important strategy when it comes to health. So then to kind of tease this out a little bit more, you know, ketogenic diet and low carb diets get a really bad rap because they're high fat, right? <laughs> this is just vilification of, of fat. And so, um, talk to me about high fat diets and ketogenic diets and their role in cardiovascular disease prevention. Yeah. So, you know, again, the, uh, we really don't have any evidence, uh, that, you know, ketogenic diets cause are contributing to heart disease, cause heart disease, uh, and, and realize that, you know, ketogenic diets have been around a long time. Uh, so, um, you know, if there was, uh, heart disease being caused by ketogenic diets, it, it probably would have been, you know, teased out by now. Um, so, um, Again, the, the whole concept that saturated fat in the diet in particular is causative of heart disease is, is it, it's just flat out wrong at this point. And, and in fact, you know, the organizations that, you know, promoted that uh, theory, the American Heart Association and the U.S. Dietary Guidelines have both, you know, stepped back from that. Now, they did it very quietly. Uh, they don't promote the fact, but if you dig into those U.S. dietary guidelines, you find the statement uh, that, you know, saturated fat is no longer a nutrient of concern. Um, the American Heart Association has taken out of their recommendations, you know, the limitation on saturated fat. Um, they still recommend low-fat diets, but they don't, you know, uh, specifically talk about saturated fat anymore. So, you know, a high-fat diet can be problematic if it's a bunch of polyunsaturated um, processed fats, you know, if you were getting all your fat from vegetable and seed oils, that is going to be a problem. And unfortunately, one of the things that I see in the ketogenic community, um, you know, is we've gotten all of these processed foods, you know, because it's become so trendy, uh, they, they basically reconfigure processed food and they label it keto and, I don't think that's any better for you than, you know, the non-keto processed food. Uh, so first and foremost, I tell people, you know, eat whole real food. Um, whether you want to do it as a carnivore, you want to do it as a vegan, you want to do it in a ketogenic diet, great. Uh, but if you're not starting with eating whole real food, each one of those diets can become problematic uh, if it's done, you know, kind of a, if it's done with a lot of processed food. Yeah. The food manufacturers are smart and they'll, you know, give your little new diet that you put a label on <laughs> a name and they still continue to make ultra processed. I mean, you've seen some of these vegan foods that have come out very highly processed, yeah. but I agree. There's ketogenic foods. I remember picking up like a, a slim fast keto shake or something one time at a grocery store it had canola oil in it. I mean, yep. very like, you know, poor quality ingredients. So people really have to be cautious about, you know, reading nutrition labels and, and, um, foods with the least with the foods that are the ingredient and don't have an ingredient list are the safest foods to eat. So, um, we've all heard a story about a guy who was eating a healthy diet. Let's say he's eating the Mediterranean diet and he's a marathon runner and he drops dead of a heart attack in the middle of this marathon. So obviously there are, let's say your diet is very optimized. There's obviously other things that contribute, um, to heart disease. Can you touch on maybe some of those other lifestyle factors that could be culprits? 
Yeah, so, uh, you know, one that we definitely need to mention, and we almost don't mention it because it's so obvious, is smoking. You know, smoking is a, another major contributor to heart disease. Uh, now, thankfully, you know, the, the smoking rates uh, have gone down, at least here in the United States. And really, that's probably the primary reason that we saw, you know, some decrease in heart disease uh, when you kind of look, you know, from 1980 to about 2000 there was a decrease. Now, since 2000, that rate has actually leveled off and then started to go back up again, which is concerning. Uh, but most of that decrease between 1980 and 2000 is probably attributable to smoking cessation. Um, the other factors uh, that uh, you know contribute to metabolic disease in general and heart disease in particular are things like your activity levels, your stress level and how you sleep. Uh, these are not, these are each individually, you know, significant contributors to your health. And I think if you're really, you know, trying to dial, dial in your diet and lifestyle, you have to be paying attention to these other factors as well. Yeah. I think it seems so cliche, but we say like stress, like, you know, don't be stressed. I, I was talking to a Seam Maholtra this last year, and um, he was talking about this study on meditation and about how like 40 minutes of meditation a day could like reverse heart disease. And I'm like, 40 minutes, <laughs> That's yeah. 40 minutes to meditate. But um, I can't meditate for that long, but yes. <laughs> but um, you know, the, I was just going to yeah. say the way that I talk about stress to people is that, listen, we can't eliminate stress. We all have stressful lives. There is stress all around us, um, but you need to figure out some way to process that stress, some way to deal with it. Um, and, you know, that could be meditation. For some people, it's religion. Other people, it's just family and strong community ties. Um, whatever it is, you know, vacation, just find <laughs> some way to unload that stress. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Vacations are great. Uh, you know, sauna, I talk to people about, you know, mm. it, it, sauna has been shown. Uh, it, it's interesting when you look at the data on uh, high blood pressure, hypertension, you know, sauna is as effective, maybe even more effective than most of the medications that we have for high blood pressure. Uh, and yet, you know, we don't talk about that enough. And I think there are many things about sauna that make it beneficial. Um, one of them being the, the stress relief, the relaxation you get when you're in the sauna. Uh, there's also effects on, you know, things like nitric oxide uh, and endothelial health and sweating out toxins. Um, these are all beneficial things, but uh, you got to find some way ultimately to deal with the stress that's around you. I don't tell people you have to eliminate stress because that is not something that we can do. Yeah. So all of this is tied back to the autonomic nervous system, right? Like the sympathetic nervous system. So how does it, how does it cause heart disease? How does it contribute to heart disease? Yeah. Well, you know, it, it, a lot of it probably still interacts with metabolic health because when you look at, you know, what happens when we get stressed and the cortisol level goes up and then our blood sugar goes up and we know that the high, you know, levels of sugar in the bloodstream are damaging to the blood vessel wall. Uh, and that, uh, you know, that can cause stress. Now there are very interesting situations where stress directly causes heart disease. It's a very well described, uh, condition. It's called uh, Takasubo, you know, uh, uh, myositis or Takasubo disease, um, where, you know, acute episodes of stress can lead to basically heart attacks and decreased heart function without any blockages in the arteries. Uh, so, you know, that is a very real condition and we don't quite understand what's happening there. Um, you know, probably it's just a, a sudden increase in the demand for, you know, oxygen and energy by the uh, cells of the heart that can't be met. And, uh, you know, you end up in a situation where you have damage to your heart cells. Uh, so we know that stress directly, you know, it, it, acute stressful episodes can cause heart disease. And then over the long run, I think chronic stress, you know, interacts a lot with metabolic health. Um, you also can't separate out the fact that people who are more stressed people who don't sleep well, 
they tend to be metabolically unhealthy. Uh, so, you know, there's some interaction there as well. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Like all the things you're naming are like the pillars of my book, right? It's like how we eat, yep. how we move, how we sleep and how we, you know, respond to stress. Okay. So talk to me about your current, um, practice. You're down in Florida. How has this personal transformation and all this information that we've talked about on the podcast today, how has it really shifted your practice and how you care for patients? Yeah, so I actually these late these days lead a uh, sort of dual professional life. So um, I continue to work as a heart surgeon, and I travel to do so. Uh, I do, do locums work, and I travel around the country uh, for my heart surgery work. In addition, I have a telemedicine practice where I see patients throughout the United States to help them not to need heart surgery, to keep them off my operating table, so to speak. And you know, we do the deep dives on all these issues that we've been talking about, diet and lifestyle and cholesterol and, and uh, all of the factors that go into heart disease. Uh, so um, it's a very interesting uh, you know, kind of uh, professional line that I straddle these days, sort of in the system, but outside of the system. Uh, there are a lot of things that go on in the traditional medical system that I see every day as a heart surgeon in the hospital that, that quite frankly, you know, horrify me and disgust me. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I have this other practice that's sort of on the fringes of the system, I guess you could say, uh, where I really, you know, feel like I help the people who want to be helped in that way. And uh, they're both, you know, they're both rewarding. I mean, doing heart surgery on someone and improving their life in that way is a very rewarding thing. Uh, but what's so different about what I do now uh, as a heart surgeon is I also have that conversation with the patient. And I say, listen, you know, you have advanced disease, you need this surgery, we're going to improve your life with this surgery, maybe save your life with this surgery, depending on the situation but it's not addressing what led you to get here in the first place. And if we don't address that part of it, we're gonna end up in a bad place. And uh, so I have that conversation with them. I, you know, unfortunately my contact with the patient is somewhat limited as a heart surgeon. You know, I only get to see them for one or two visits, uh, but I try and at least plant the seed that you gotta address the factors that led to you getting here in the first place. Yeah. Have you found any allies in the cardiology, cardiothoracic space? Uh, I mean, is there, is this movement growing in that space or are you kind of isolated one voice? Yeah. So it's still, it's still very lonely. You know, as you know, there are a number of cardiologists out there now, you know, guys like Asim Mahaltra and uh, Brett Scher and Christian Assad, uh, you know, who, who talk about the same things and, and, you know, uh, share a similar philosophy. Uh, there's really only one other heart surgeon I know who talks about any of this and, and he's no longer in active practice. Steve Gundry, uh, you know, is a heart surgeon as well. Um, it's interesting though, when I talk to my colleagues, many of them are doing ketogenic and low carb diets. Um, they like just for themselves for themselves. Yeah. They just won't take that leap and start talking to their patients about it. Uh, and they're certainly not out there, you know, on social media and, and, uh, you know, uh, being vocal about it. So I think that's kind of unfortunate, you know, as a physician, I think if you know something that can help a patient and you're not actively telling patients about that, you know, that's a big problem. But of course I understand, you know, they're, they're somewhat afraid. I mean, their, their livelihoods are at risk. Uh, we do know a number of physicians who have, you know, had their licenses challenged, uh, you know, been put through trials uh, for speaking out like this. Yeah. Uh, so it's understandable, but, you know, I, I think it's unconscionable. Uh, and, and I just know I couldn't live with myself if I knew this and wasn't using it to help uh, my patients. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So let's talk about that. You know, if they're what's out there. So we end every podcast, you guys, with the semen analysis, and I've pulled um, a great article from the Journal of American College of Cardiology, very respectable journal, and it is titled, um, let me just pull this up here, I'm clicking from all my different windows, 
Um, this is called therapeutic potential of ketone bodies for patients with cardiovascular disease. And this was just published in April of 2021. And in the abstract, you know, they really describe everything we've talked about here on the podcast today, how metabolic perturbations really underlie a variety of cardiovascular disease states and metabolic interventions to prevent or treat these disorders is sparse. Like this conversation that we've had today, like this is not the conversation that's happening in clinics and in hospitals and not where a lot of research money is, uh, is headed. And as we've kind of highlighted and they highlight in this write-up that ketones kind of carry this negative clinical stigma, um, because they're involved with diabetic ketoacidosis or people are afraid to tell people to eat fat in the diet, but really evidence from both experimental and clinical research has really uncovered a protective role for ketones in cardiovascular disease. And basically these ketones provide supplemental fuel for an energy starved heart. Um, but the cardiovascular effects also extend far beyond just energy for the heart and ketone bodies are shown to influence a variety of different cellular processes, including gene transcription, inflammation, and oxidative stress, endothelial function, cardiac remodeling, and other cardiovascular risk factors. And this paper, if you want to read the entire thing, you can go find it in the journal of American cardiology basically reviews all of these bioenergetic and these other, what they call pleiotropic effects of ketone bodies that can contribute to the improvement in cardiovascular disease. And I think this is just so important. And I want to highlight this because I think when people hear about the ketogenic diet, they think about it for weight loss. They think it's just some fad diet, you know, to lose a few pounds and that it's not sustainable long-term. That's what I hear all the time. Um, I, I can't remember what you said when you started, but I mean, I've been eating a form of a low carbon ketogenic diet basically since 2015. And the highlights, like I said, of this is that ketones are protective to the heart. We have data to support that. Um, they do also highlight that exogenous ketones could become an alternative to the ketogenic diet for elevating ketone bodies. So these are ketones that would come in like a liquid or a powder form that maybe could be helpful for patients you know, who are in heart failure, uh, or have cardiovascular disease, we certainly need, you know, more studies to keep supporting this. Um, but I think there's a growing body of evidence that therapeutic ketosis, which is defined as having ketones above 0.5 millimoles per liter, um, can really have some incredible effects and cellular signaling effects on the cardiovascular system. So I don't know if you have anything to weigh in there, Dr. Avedi. I think it just really, you know, solidifies a lot of the things we've talked about here. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, um, you know, when you look at the scientific, uh, you know, kind of research around ketones, uh, uh, I think heart failure is one of the areas where, you know, we have seen the most uh, robust evidence that they might have benefit. You know, I always, I always, you know, heart failure and Alzheimer's disease are probably uh, two areas where, you know, ketones have uh, shown a lot of promise in scientific research. And what do these what do heart failure and Alzheimer's disease have in common? Um, you know, they are metabolic diseases. And so I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and we know that the heart and the brain are the two biggest, you know, utilize the organs that utilize uh, ketone bodies most effectively. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense that ketones can help with heart disease. And I, 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 I'm hopeful that that continues to get explored more. Yeah. This use of exogenous ketones is very fascinating to me too. I remember even, I think it was like 2016, I would have to find the study, but it was a rat study, but they basically induced a heart attack in these rats and they gave them intravenous ketone bodies after they induced this heart attack. And the rats that were given ketone bodies, it reduced, it mitigated the amount of damage to the cardio, to the myocytes, to the actual like heart itself, the damage that happened yeah. because yeah they induced this heart attack, but the, the, the cardiac cells were able to use the ketone bodies. And so they didn't starve and die, you know, essentially. So I was really fascinated by that. And then, um, I believe it was Jeff Bullock was doing, uh, participating in a study on stage four breast cancer patients. So he's got these patients that are like not responding to treatment anymore. And they put them on a ketogenic diet and they were following these patients with a PET scan. So this is a tagged glucose molecule. It's a nuclear scan. And cancer lights up because cancer is really metabolically active. So these, these women, right, they, they light up like a Christmas tree. They have stage four breast cancer all over. But what was crazy was in the initial scans on these patients before they in, initiated a ketogenic diet, the heart, because it's so metabolically active, 
it lights up on a PET scan. There's not cancer in the heart. Cancer of the heart is like very rare. Um, yep. but the heart lights up on these PET scans, but they put them on a ketogenic diet and on the repeat PET scans, not only did they have less breast cancer, um, because you're starving the cancer, but the heart no longer lit up because in this ketogenic state, the heart was using ketones as a preferential fuel source instead of glucose. So it didn't even light up anymore. And that was another like aha moment for me. I'm like, okay, that's, that's really cool. So I think that there's so many effects that, you know, we're still learning about, but I think there's, there's definitely therapeutic potential here. And it'll be really, really awesome to see what happens. Um, as people like you, you know, continue to talk about this exact topic. Yeah. So, very fascinating area. So hopefully it gets pursued more. Yeah. Hopefully in our time, <laughs> exactly. uh, we can, that we can be alive to, uh, to, uh, experience it. Well, Dr. Avedia, tell people how they can find you, um, if they want to become a patient or consult with you or, uh, tell them how they can find your book as well. Sure thing. So the book is called Stay Off My Operating Table. It's, you know, available at all the usual places. Uh, you can go to my website, ifixhearts.com, uh, and find out about uh, all the things that I offer. I have my, my private medical practice. I also have a uh, coaching program, a group coaching program that's available, uh, and a number of courses, and you can find the book there as well. On social media, I am most active on Twitter at ifixhearts. Uh, I am on Instagram as well at uh, Ovadia Heart Health. And uh, thankfully, my name is not that common. So just uh, put it into the uh, search engine and you'll probably come across me. I mean, I tell people just type in Dr. Seaman, like there can't be that many of us. <laughs> exactly. I'd be afraid. I'd be afraid what their Google search would find. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to misspell it. Yeah, yeah. Well, this has been so wonderful, Phil. Thank you for, uh, you know, coming on here and talking about these super important topics. And for anybody listening, please send this podcast to your friends and family, because you guys are the real troops for us that disseminate this information and keep this conversation going because we can help so many people. Um, you know, if we can really start to kind of spread the message and, you know, open people's minds to some of these topics. So please leave your reviews and share this on your social media. We appreciate it so much. And we'll catch you guys on the next episode. Did you guys love that last episode of the Fit and Fabulous podcast? Well, of course you did. And I want to keep bringing you the most amazing content from the most incredible people. And you can help me by subscribing to the Dr. Fit and Fabulous channel. You guys know where the button is. Just click it. It's the doctor's orders.